scanning for audio. Welcome once again to the Tim Dog Podcast. Many of you experienced my ramblings on the WhoCast just after Christmas, where I talked at far too much length for some people's liking about the next Doctor. Well, as it's coming out on DVD, and I haven't covered it as part of the TDP, and also because it's part of the ridiculously good Doctor Who at the Proms, I thought I'd cover a small review just for the completists amongst us, including myself, just so that I've covered all of the things I should have covered in the first place when my voice was just about to break. As you can probably hear, again I'm on the edge of just another cold. Hurrah! To live in England! Usually, of course, I dedicate each Tin Dog podcast to someone who's donated cash towards keeping the TDP running. However, with the sad passing of Patrick McGowan this week, and everyone is aware of how much of a fan of The Prisoner I am, I have to dedicate this show to him. Thanks, Patrick, for all of your brilliant work over the years. You will be missed. However, I was unaware that Patrick was actually offered the role of Gandalf, and he was also offered the role of Dumbledore. He would have made one of the world's best Dumbledores, but he had to turn them down due to ill health. But enough melancholia. On with the next Doctor. Stand back! What have we got here, then? Hold on, hold on, who are you? I'm the Doctor. Simply the Doctor, the one, the only, and the best. Before I go into my reasonable discussion on the next Doctor, I just need to play you something, something Russell said as part of his audio commentary for the next Doctor. You see, I, uh, mistakenly as it turns out, was beginning to think that Doctor Who itself, the series, was moving all the way to the autumn schedule using these specials to place themselves throughout the year and take us well into 2010. Thus, Tennant would still leave in 2010 and the series would be on when it was dark, when Doctor Who was at its best, when I was a child, during the winter season. Of course I was wrong. Here's Russell to explain why. People think that, like, the last two specials are going next Easter, so that Series 5 might be delayed till the autumn of 2010, which isn't no. being talked about at all. No, this is not what I'm only bringing that up so because the sort of person listening to this podcast is the sort of person who worries about things like that. Don't and worry, fear not. Fear not. That's not the plan. I, like every other Doctor Who fan before Christmas, was playing the whole Who Will Be the Eleventh Doctor? Is the Next Doctor a storyline to do with Who Will Be the Next Doctor? What's actually going on? And of course, after the Children in Need special, we all got caught up in a hole. He's not really the real Doctor. He's someone who thinks he's the Doctor. And being bears of very little brain, we jumped straight on the Big Finish bandwagon and ended up in a place we really shouldn't have been. Now for those of you who are unaware, the Big Finish story, The One Doctor, of which this is the trailer, 
citizens of Genarios, you will listen. These readings? Well, the TARDIS is way off course. Way, way off course. We drifted millennia into the far future. I have been sent to collect tribute. So, where exactly are we? The vulgar end of time. I must have the three greatest treasures of the Genarios system, or I will destroy you all. What's happened? We've only just arrived. We picked up a distress call. Oh, sorry. Wasted journey. Well, we've been saved. The Skeloids are vanquished. So what happened to these Skeloids? The Doctor sorted them out for us, didn't he? Did you say the Doctor? Doctor, Doctor, you've done so much for us. How can we ever repay you? I don't expect repayment. The work I do is reward in itself. Anyway, Sally Ann and I really must get back to the Stardis. Looks like you've already saved the day then. Beaten yourself to it. I somehow doubt it. I've never been to Junerios before. You don't reckon they rumbled us? We ought to get out of here. And lose our chance of a hundred million credits. You're really rattled, aren't you? Yes. Because if I didn't save this planet from the evil Skeloids, who is the doctor that did? Bring me the tribute. The tribute, I say. What a plank! Concerns someone who is a confidence trickster in the distant future, the vulgar end of time, pretending to be the Doctor for nefarious purposes. This didn't quite ring true with what we'd seen, but it was the only story that was out there where someone pretended to be the Doctor. It also led us to look at other Big Finish stories. The Big Finish story, which of course caught my eye, was Minuet in Hell, which had originally been one of the audio visuals which were fan made Doctor Who stories. Now in the original Minuet in Hell, an actor, I believe it might have been Nicholas Briggs, had played the Doctor and somebody else played someone else who thought they were the Doctor because their mind had gone into them in a kind of a pocket watchy kind of a way. And in keeping with that, the pocket watch did make appearances in some of the Radio Times photography that was available a few weeks beforehand. Here's Minuet in Hell's trailer. The legends of Gallifrey speak of a world where everything is horror, horror, and pain. A world from where there is no escape. From the creatures who crawl on the crust of the land. Of the lost, and the hopeless, and the broken, and the doomed. Strange chap, that one. If it's all right, I... May pop back again tomorrow to check up on him. Fellow interests me. No problem, Mr. Lethbridge Stewart. Uh, tomorrow, any time. The legends of Gallifrey speak of a world in the name of the world they speak of. Is hell. Hell is where I have come to last. And there can be no escape. And so I cannot escape. My own hell. You're a bit of a sad case, aren't you? Of course, with that one, you have Paul McGann still playing the Doctor. Which is fine, but you kind of know when a guy says he's the Doctor and it isn't Paul McGann, that really sums things up. And so, as fans, we were left squabbling over which of those stories was really the one with the most influence. And of course, Russell had taken those basic ideas of someone thinks he's the Doctor and ran with it. And was that really what this story was all about? Or was that just the bit that was meant to distract us? Well, I don't like using the word hardcore fans, but you know what I mean. All this reasonable squabbling and backfighting between all the fans going, oh, but it's going to be like the one Doctor, it's going to be like Minuet in Hell, were all very nice. But like I said... They were here just to distract us. And distract us they did, all the way until Christmas Day. And then Christmas Day wheeled itself round, and like waiting for that lovely present, we all suddenly got just a little bit nervous. You see, the Christmas specials are often looked on in their own unique way. Some people only judge the Christmas specials together, as separate from the series, for some odd reason. I can see their point, as Christmas specials are here to distract the multitude not just the hardcore fans, but 
Everyone's a hardcore fan these days, or so it seems. Families across the nation, and eventually families around the world within the hour, were all gathered in front of their TVs, or in many cases later on, monitors or Wi-Fi connections or signal senders or whatever they were going to end up watching it by that day, and spent Christmas with the Doctor. The Cyber King will rise. The Cyber King will rise. Indeed. I like a man. I'm going to put my hands up straight away and say this is possibly my favourite Christmas special. I say possibly because it depends whether you count The Unquiet Dead as being a Christmas special. It's a story set at Christmas, I'll grant you that, but it wasn't actually on on Christmas Day. Now, as we all know, The Unquiet Dead is one of my all-time favourite stories of New Who. It's part of that great trilogy that I would show people if they were trying to get someone to watch the whole new series. But if we leave that to one side, because it is part of the series, and just look at Christmas specials, this is my favourite. It's my favourite for a few reasons. And I know I've been quoted left, right and centre as saying, Clockwork Transformers, what not to like? And you know, that's kind of how I feel about this. The storyline itself splits very neatly into two. The first half, storyline A we'll call it, is of course what we've come to expect. It was the storyline we were fed beforehand. It was the next Doctor. Is the person we see, Mr Lake, the Doctor? That gave us something to discuss. It gave us something for the fans to look at. It allowed us to experience the first Doctors and see Paul McGann appear, which for a lot of people is a very, very important moment. This storyline, storyline A, finishes about halfway through the episode at just the right moment, because as a member of the audience, I was sitting there going, right, that's out the way, let's get on with the, the main course. And the main course for a lot of people, that's what's caused the arguments. The story begins with the Cybermen. A long time away, and not so far from here, the Cybermen were fought. And they were beaten. And they were sent into a howling wilderness called the Void. Locked inside forevermore. But then a greater battle rose up. So great that everything inside the Void perished. But as the walls of the world weakened, the last of the Cybermen must have fallen through the dimensions, back in time, to land here. And they found you. I fought them, I know that. You see, I liked the Cyberman story. Okay, it's got holes in it. Most Cyberman stories do. But deep down, it was the overriding storyline of the whole piece. The Cyberman had apparently escaped the vortex that they were left in. They'd been upgrading themselves, I'm not quite sure what with. And they'd used Dalek technology, again I'm not quite sure how they got it off them, to escape the vortex, probably through the whole where Canary Wharf will be one day, landed in London and set about building some massive conversion device. A conversion device that the Doctor seems very familiar with, but we've never seen before. Unless, of course, you count some of the Doctor Who Big Finish 8th Doctor stories. But even then, you're dealing with the real Cybermen, not the Cybus men, the ones from Pete's World. And you must remember that these Cybermen are just the ones from Pete's World. Our Cybermen are probably in tombs elsewhere. Yes, I know that the Cybermen from our universe have a variety of different designs, but until the two Cybermen meet, or at least there's some throwaway remarks, some fans will never be truly happy. But like I said, that's not important. We've got lots of things that we could argue about, we could discuss, we could niggle about. I mean, the Cyber Wraiths, what's all that about? I know the original Cybermen, our universe's Cybermen, had Cybermats. They had creatures that they had converted. What was the point of creatures who'd been cybertized, if you're looking for a word, only to make them appear more animalistic? Surely turning them into robots would make them more mechanical-like. I'm also not sure what, what particularly the creatures were that were turned into the cyber wraiths, cyber shades, or whatever they were called. Because if they were cats and dogs, one of them seen driving a coach, like I've said before, would you let your cat drive a coach? So was it an involved simian? Was it, perhaps, one of the children? Is that what some of the children were used for? It makes the whole story slightly darker and slightly seedier. 
which is good because it's Christmas and that's what we like at Christmas. The thing that a lot of people have got issues with isn't that Paul McGann turns up at one point, albeit in photographic form. It's more that the giant clockwork toy, the steampunk Cyberman, if you like, doesn't really fit. It's going around destroying people. The fact that it's built using children, yeah, children, that well-known labour force that's always useful, it turns the whole thing a bit more, well, Oliver-like. Let me die happy. Just tell me one thing. What do you need those children for? What are children ever needed for? They're a workforce. But for what? And Jackson Lake's child. A decent enough performance. But was it me or was he wearing more mascara than a panda? These are all small niggles. I like the design. And I don't want to have a go at this episode. Like I said, it's my favourite Christmas special. It's so much better than last year's. And for a start, it doesn't have Kylie in it. It sets up the whole lonely doctor for the rest of the specials, and we're more than happy with it. But what was the point? I know the end was a bit clunky. And again, I have questions about the Cybersmen. How come their heads always explode? Do they just get a little bit too excited? And I'm sure their wiring is a little bit dodgy, on the grounds that the only two people who've ever managed to override the Cybers programming are women. Perhaps that's something we're going to look at much later in other stories. You anyway. Your mind is riven with anger and abuse and revenge. These have no place in a cyber mind. Activate. It was nice that the incredibly damaged Mercy was able to infect the Cybermen with emotions. Small touches like that really, really helped this thing hold together. Considering that it was the 15th story made on the trot, the standard was incredibly high. I loved it. What more can I say? What more can I say? And the answer to that, is, of course, is the extras on the DVD. And this extra was Doctor Who at the proms. Before I record the Tin Dog podcasts, I like to transfer some of the things I'm talking about on my MP3 player in order to experience the narratives and listen out for things I may have missed so I can make extra notes. It's one of those little sad things. And I must admit, since it was first on, Doctor Who at the Proms has not been off my player. It's just wonderful to listen to, especially if you have a decent stereo setup. Crank up that volume and just listen to it. You know your favourite bands? Well, you've got series 1, 2, 3 and 4 as soundtrack CDs. They say the studio albums. And this, this is the live concert. And it's a great concert. I genuinely wish I'd been there. How great would it be to experience, you know, Cyberman walking straight past you if you were, say, 6. Oh, sod that. Even now. It was just brilliant to watch. It was so well filmed, but the sound quality is just off the scale. I know everyone listens to their own soundtrack albums time and time again. Well, all right, I know I do. But here, and it's only down as a DVD extra, and it could have been released by itself. It's so, so good. So we've got the music that's played, which you're already familiar with, but it's all been tweaked slightly so that it could be performed live. Uh, For example, you heard the live version of the Doctor Who theme tune. The only bit they couldn't do live is that first opening sting noise because of course that exists electronically. But things like a live version of Doomsday just 
wonderful to listen to, incredibly atmospheric. They're all hosted by people from the show. You've got Freema, you've got Catherine Tate, all talking a little bit about their characters, all really, really embracing the time. It seemed magical, and it was. Halfway through, about 25 minutes in, there is a specially filmed sequence. Now, whether this is canon or not, I can leave you to debate that yourself in pubs. But basically, the Doctor is sitting in the TARDIS, composing about the music of the spheres, which is the sound of the universe. A Grask turns up, and then escapes from the TARDIS into the audience with the Doctor's water pistol. Hilarity ensues, apparently. And it's a very nice, comical piece. The Daleks and Davros turn up. This is not a cheap affair. As a stage show, it's very, very good. And it's all performed by the London Philharmonic. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of what the proms really is, it was an idea put forward 100, 150 years ago to introduce great music to the masses. And they did for a very long time. The ticket prices were held cheap, and they were nearly always held in the same venue, Royal Albert Hall. A gigantic, round venue. Perfect for classical music. The BBC have evolved this idea to incorporate the electric proms, which again is a fabulous idea. And here we have music that we're already familiar with being given back to us, Doctor Who at the proms. The audience is really into it. The atmosphere is incredible. And the odd time on the recording, you do hear a small screaming child who perhaps was a little bit too young to be there, piercing the perfect musical recordings. I love Doctor Who at the proms. And like I said, it's like owning a live album. Next time, I'll be talking about the second part of the E-Space trilogy. So until then, here's the Doctor to talk about how wonderful music really is. Be seeing you. Just remember, music isn't just orchestras and pop stars and special people with albums and downloads and concerts. It's you. Because the music of the sphere is all around you. When you're on your own, just close your eyes. And you'll hear it. Music. Inside your head. Because everyone's a musician. Everyone's got a song inside them. Every single one of you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk TARDIS, T-A-R-D-I-S. It stands for Tethered Aerial Release Developed in Style. <laughs> Do you see?